Howard Bloom is the author of six books, beginning with The Lucifer Principle, A Scientific Expedition into the Forces of History. He is the founder of three international scientific groups, including the Space Development Steering Committee. He's a, mem a member of uh, both the board and the board of governors of the National Space Society. Please welcome Howard Bloom. This is premised on the notion that a nation that looks up goes up, and a nation that looks down goes down. And I have been distressed to discover over the last God knows how many years that ours as a society, and by ours I'm including America and I'm including Europe, Western civilization in general, is a society that is looking down. And given the fact, in fact, people used to come into my home and say, this is the worst civilization in the history of mankind. It's produced more violence than any civilization in history. I'm so glad it's dying. And these are our serious intellectuals from our intellectual elite. And I don't agree with them, because if you were born in um, the West in 1850, your average lifespan would have been 38.5 years. If you've been born in 2000, your average, average lifespan would have been uh, 78.5 years. That's two, more than two lifetimes for the price of one. If you gave a Stanford Binet IQ test from 1900 to your average college dummies today, the ones that we are told are being dumbed down by technology, they would measure, the average kids would measure as marginal geniuses, 135 IQ. Um, the poorest paid worker in London in 2000 was paid what an entire tenement full of the poorest paid workers in London were paid in 1850. Plus, they had privileges that the wealthiest, most influential man in England could not achieve. He died at the age of 42 after gathering all of the technologies from all over the world to a building he half designed himself. It was called the Crystal Palace. It was 1851, the Great Exposition. His name was Prince Albert. He was married to Queen Victoria, presumably had money and power and he died at 42 from an illness that could have been cured today with the kind of antibiotic that would be given to a homeless person if he were brought into the emergency room. So I want this civilization to live because, look, if our great-grandparents gave us, doubled our lifespan, increased our IQs to this extent, increased our incomes to this extent, then it's your job and my job to make sure that our great-great-grandkids have another quadrupling in the amount of money they make, have another quadrupling in the, the lifetime they're able to live, and have a quadrupling or a doubling. I'll, I'll make a deal with you, just a doubling in intelligence, okay? So we have to save this civilization, um, or we're going to be killing lots of future people. So I wrote this as a visual manifesto for where we're going next, and with relationship to with relationship to everything that we've heard so far, there is a highly modular, autonomously intelligent, self-replicating system at work in this universe. We know it because there's a certain amount of it on this particular planet. And it's called life. And this is about bringing space to life by bringing life to space. Why? Because life operates under a simple imperative. It's First of all, it's incredibly robust. Uh, an RNA or DNA strand has eight billion atoms working together. That sounds like an incredibly tricky proposition. It should be incredibly delicate. And yet, think of the planet. When, the, when, when our planet was born and when life was born, in the early times of this planet, the planet rotated around its axis every six hours. That meant for three hours you had a flood of this deadly stuff called radiation. And for another three hours you had something almost as deadly, total darkness. The temperature went up by an approximate 88 degrees and then back down 88 degrees every three hours. The, it was a poison pill of a planet. It had phosphorus, it had sulfur, it had ammonia. All these things are deadly. And yet, life survived all of this stuff. And it survived all of this stuff by taking every poison that was tossed its way and turning it into a pleasure and a treat. Um, taking every wasteland and turning it into a wonderland. So this is a little unrealistic. It says, nature has given us a challenge. How do we get from here to here? Now, of course, 
this is a picture we've seen forever of the moon. That's Earthrise, the famous picture. And we want to go to here. Now, we, it's going to be hard to achieve it here because that's the moon. But there are lots of other gravity balls up there above our head, approximately 400 others that we could possibly live on just in this solar system alone. And then look at all we've discovered about other solar systems recently. Um, we, and additionally, hey, why have to go to existing real estate, these gravity balls in the sky? Why not build our own? This is an O'Neill colony in a libation point between Earth and the moon. OK, how do we get there? How do we do this? Um, oh, not to mention this. This is another O'Neill colony in space, um, complete with the San Francisco and nostalgists stuff. So 3.85 billion years ago, we have this toxic planet, absolutely toxic planet. And, in, and it is a planet, one thing to recognize, don't let people tell you that climate change is an anthropogenic invention. Because we just talked about that enormous climate change of the Earth swiveling around its axis um, and going from radiation flood to, to night every three hours. But then there's this little tilt to the planet. And that gives us this massive climate change called summer, winter, fall, and spring. So this is a planet of climate catastrophe, and life has survived it. In part, it has survived it through some space programs. Um, life started in the sea, but approximately, let's go back if we know how to do that, approximately a billion years ago, life began to crawl out onto the land. Now look, if you'd been the parents, and I had been the kid, and I said I was going to go up above the surface tension onto this rock, you would have said the logical thing. You are absolutely crazy. There's nothing up there, nothing. That is stone. That leaves you naked. The sea gave you birth. The sea was your mother. How dare you leave it in order to climb up above your head and go to this absolute poisonous wasteland? And yet life did it, and it greened the face of the planet. Um, and we're, let's jump to modern times, and I'll tell you a story about some loony dinosaurs if I manage to get that far before these lights change. Um, we've been taking the resources of space and bringing them back down to Earth for a long time now. We'll skip all the stuff that we've done with sunlight over the course of the last few billion years. Let's forget about that. Um, but we put this up in 1962. It's Telstar. Those little medallions encrusted on its, on its exterior, those are what folks from 1962, these oldsters, uh, thought of as solar panels. They're harvesting solar energy in space. And then what are they doing with it? They're sending it back down to Earth. We call it a transmission. It's an electromagnetic signal that's coming down here. It, could just as the, it is being used for energy. It's being used to operate amplifiers. Um, Whoops, we went backwards again. OK, um, SpaceX. In the year since this document was written, SpaceX has already changed the name of the game in ways that this didn't anticipate. But SpaceX has made a simple observation. Today, putting something into space is very expensive because you buy a $100 million to $400 million rocket. You fly it for approximately eight minutes until its tank of propellant runs out. And then you throw it away. Well, if you wanted to get from here to San Francisco, and you bought a Rolls Royce, and you drove it until the first tank of gas ran out, and then you ditched it, preferably in the Pacific, and somewhere nobody could find it, and you bought another Rolls Royce, how much would it cost you to get to San Francisco? That's not the way we do things. We reuse things. So Elon Musk, in addition to building this Falcon Heavy, which will probably fly in a year or two, um, is building reusable rockets, and he's already testing them, their reusability. He put up one about two weeks ago. Uh, the, it made the news because it delivered a Dragon capsule that took a bunch of cargo to space, and then it picked up a bunch of used experiments and other cargo, used stuff, and brought it back down to Earth, something no other company can do right now in the United States. The military space industrial complex version of this capsule, which is touted as having virtually the same characteristics, does not. It goes up, it delivers its cargo, and then it's thrown away in the sea, and it cannot bring a single used science experiment back down to Earth because the military space industrial complex compared to private industry, or at least Elon Musk, is stupid. 
Um, and, and you guys are demonstrating to me that it's not really that stupid because you're doing some amazing things. Um, so these are the rockets that are coming back down. The most recent uh, Falcon 9 that took a Dragon capsule to space, um, it, the, the real story was not in the Dragon capsule. The real story was in the first stage of the rocket because the first stage of the rocket had retro rockets and landing legs. And once it did its job and put its payload up, then it began a controlled landing and came down ever so gently with its landing legs extended just above the face of the sea and then plopped into the water so that Elon can analyze it, see if anything went wrong, and do a few of these flights over the sea before he finally does what he's going to do and land them on land, turn them around in 10 hours, refuel them, and 10 hours later have them going back up again the way that 747s do it now or 707s or 737s. This is an alternative concept. Um, Buzz Aldrin loves this one, and he's the one who actually turned me on to this particular approach, piggybacking. And this is a horizontal takeoff with an autonomous first stage lander. And the closest to this these days is what uh, Richard Branson is planning to do um, with Virgin Galactic. Um, but it may never, it may, I mean, Elon's going to occupy the field very shortly. Um, the president of Virgin Galactic, who's a friend, I asked him a few months ago, but what are you guys planning beyond suborbital? And he said, oh, we've got plans. Well, OK, I want to see them. Um, this is Richard Branson's version of a spaceport for these piggybacking uh, horizontal takeoff devices, which will also I mean all of these things will lower the cost of access to space from, in the worst case, $38,000 a pound today to somewhere around $300 a pound. That's a big alteration. That's going to save a lot of money and make it, make it possible for you to fly an awful lot more of your ideas into space. Um, OK, so it asks what the fruits are going to be of all of this. And the Russians, the Spanish, all kinds of people have these ideas for hotels in space. The Japanese. Um, there are two asteroid mining companies right now. Um, and two people, I just finished the National Space Society's annual conference, and um, I, I ran into two people who grabbed me and said, I need you on my advisory board. I'm starting an asteroid mining company. Well, I'm already on the advisory board of one of them, and one of these people said, I don't care, I don't care, my funding came through today. Can you, as long as you don't tell the other guys what we're doing. Okay, and you know that asteroids, a single asteroid, um, can have 17 trillion to 31, this is a mid-sized asteroid, by the way, a sev 17 trillion to 31 trillion dollars worth of raw material. 17 trillion dollars is bigger than the gross domestic product of the United States. 31 trillion is approximately the gross domestic product of humanity, the world. That's one asteroid. And if you use the stuff up in space to build giant tin cans in the sky, uh, steel and glass, O'Neill colonies, and uh, colonies with uh, 500 square feet, miles or more of land, hey, it'll be even more valuable than it is right now. Um, this is Deep Space Industries, Rick Tumlinson's asteroid mining company. He does a terrific job of art direction. This is Planetary Resources. That's uh, Peter Diamandis, James Cameron, the movie maker, and um, Larry Page, the founder of Google. Um, these are some Japanese concepts of what we'll do in space. We'll have hotels up there, they say, on the moon. Well, Buzz Aldrin will tell you, I mean, sit down to talk to Buzz Aldrin sometime, and he will tell you the moon is not a fit place for human beings. But you guys are going to do microenvironmental alteration, so you never know. Um, this is Shimizu Japanese concepts for uh, stuff in space. This is commercialization of space. Um, this is Shimizu's concept for taking regolith, for taking lunar rock and using, using it as concrete, in C ISRU. Um, building stuff there, right there where your, where your raw supplies are. Um, this is the first little bit of gardening in space, uh, a Spanish hotel. Um, this was a concept for the moon. Um, okay, even though they tell you the moon is hell on humans and hell on life, everybody wants the stuff on the moon. It's going to be worth an awful lot. Again, you can make entire O'Neill colonies that are huge, huge um, structures. Um, with regolith. So there's going to be mining on the moon. Some of it will be for regolith, and some of it will be for something even more valuable, water, um, preferably at the poles, which is where you're talking about reaching. 
Um, this is a space solar power satellite. I mean, you know, we're having energy wars right now. It, the, the Chinese have just declared that the South China Sea, 1.35 million square miles of territory, is theirs, all theirs, all theirs. And the Vietnamese have been burning buildings uh, over the last few days and getting very upset because they thought uh, the spot to which the Chinese rolled out a platform in the middle of the sea and plunked it down was theirs. In fact, they're absolutely certain it's theirs. That's called an energy war. We won't have energy wars anymore because this stuff is as close to infinite as you can get. That is space uh, solar power, power harvested in space and transmitted down to Earth using um, microwaves like the ones that your cell phone uses. Transport's going to be a big item. Here's a space truck. Um, and, but you can, and, and asteroids are going to be a big deal because they're just these heaps of raw material. So here are some of the older concepts of how to deal with an asteroid, but the real way to deal with an asteroid is to attach solar panels to it, put some ion thrusters on the rear. Hey, it's a spaceship! You can re-sculpt it and architect it and smelt it and do whatever you want with it as you go along. Um, this is an old, old concept. That's a rail gun to get regolith off the moon. That's a mass driver. Um, this, okay, construction in space is going to be a whole different thing than anything we humans have ever been exposed to. Because if you can find some place solid to stand on, if there's 100 tons of stuff, you can move it with your hand. Of course, there is no stable place to stand on, but that's another problem. So this is a construction site in space where you can build something 40 miles, uh, 40 miles long and five miles in diameter, a colony, new real estate for human beings. These are old ideas, of course, of uh, space um, stations. Uh, creating their own gravity by rotating. This is uh, Buzz Aldrin's idea, um, a Mars cycler. Buzz Aldrin does celestial mechanics in his spare time, literally. And um, this is something that does a loop-the-loop -loop around the Earth, and then a loop-the-loop -loop around Mars, and then loop the loops back, all for free. You know, There's very little energy added to this, aside from what you're getting from gravity. And with these things, you can just catch the Mars cycler someplace in the Earth's general vicinity, take it to Mars, get off, possibly even fly your own little vehicle to land on the Martian surface. Um, this is uh, trucking to Mars. Uh, these things uh, will, according to the, the, the guy who created them, John Strickland, they'll go up and down between Mars orbit and back to the surface again, just carrying cargo back and forth. Um, but that's just the beginning. Uh, this is a truck stop in space where a bunch of various vehicles park and uh, unload cargo, load it up again. Uh, more stuff on Mars. Ah, this is my favorite, exploring Titan um, with a tethered vehicle, with a uh, lighter than whatever it is up there vehicle, lighter than the atmosphere vehicle. Um, and another one. Ah, what a yummy idea. Okay, and a Titan colony. Okay, now this is when this is when we begin to get to the O'Neill colonies because there's a big, big tubes of real estate in the sky. Now, we didn't invent housing tubes. Bacteria invented those approximately three billion years ago. They make them out of, among other things, titanium oxide um, in little cracks that you can't even see in rock. Um, let's be blunt, bacteria three billion years ago were raping, um, pillaging, and plundering the pristine and virginal face of the planet. Thank God or we wouldn't have life today. Uh, so they already built these tubes, which to them were humongous. Now it's up to us to start building these tubes and to start building them in space. So you'll notice that the body in the sky is not the usual moon, right? You saw that. Uh, this is uh, one of my artist's versions of a, um, a space ecosystem because the real deal in space is the same, well, once upon a time, well, I don't know if we have time for this, we don't have time for this, but once upon a time, a bunch of experts said California was absolutely worthless, it was 1848, and it was good for rattlesnakes and scorpions, and that was it, we shouldn't have messed a penny in it. That was 1848. Um, that's what people think of space right now. Well, as you all know, California turned out to be absolutely useless, and the experts were right, and none of us are here right now, right? Um, so that's what's going to happen to space. And now we're about to hit the red zone any minute. So this is a space economy. That's a more advanced space economy. This is space tourism. These are the kinds of colonies we'll live in. First the Bernal spheres, the small ones, and then we get to the big ones, to the O'Neill colonies. 
Now, these are still a little too confined for me, um, but we'll get beyond them, believe it. And I mean, take a, have a picnic at your home in an O'Neill colony, and if you go up to the top of a hill, you can fly. Fly the kid for an afternoon. Then show him gravity again. This is the ultimate. This is greening Mars. OK, now look, here's the deal. Once upon a time, we took a poison pill of a planet, a toxic place, a place of climate cataclysm. And we greened and gardened the place. If we could do it once, do you think we could do it again? And then, if I've got time, I'll tell you the tale of the loony dinosaurs who flew. Once upon a time, there was a bunch of loony dinosaurs. Now, they had a conversation of the kind I'm about to tell you about, but they did it genetically with genes. They didn't do it with language. But let me do the human version. Um, the kids wanted to go to this absolutely impossible, toxic, empty, empty place. And the adults, you know, being conservatives and seeing that every good thing was on the bosom of Mother Earth herself, said, don't you dare. That's an outrageous idea. There's nothing up there. Take a look above your head. What do you see? Clouds. Are you going to eat clouds? Look at night. What do you see? Stars. Are you going to eat stars? There's nothing there. Read my lips. Nothing. And the loony kids took to the skies anyway. And the homebodies, the conservatives, the organic folks, stuck to the bosom of Mother Earth. Where are the dinosaurs who were good conservatives and organic fetishists today? You haven't seen one in the last 65 million years. And the ones who took to the sky, there are twice as many species of them as there are of land-walking mammals, twice as many species. That means there's twice as many species, or twice as many ways of making a living up in the emptiness above our heads as there are down here on Earth. And the ones who fly live 60% longer than any of us who walk on the face of the planet in the old-fashioned way. Nature loves space programs. So that's it. 